Yes, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, the first witness this morning is Mr. Snell. Mr. Snell, do you mind standing? Would you uh, prefer to make an oath or make an affirmation? Affirmation, thank you. Please affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Snell. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Hutley. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, could you tell the Royal Commission your full name? Douglas Robert Snell. And your business address? It is Level 6, 100 Squiring Terrace, Newstead, Brisbane. And your occupation? Uh, banker, General Manager of Product, Performance and Governance at BOQ. Thank you. Um, you have received, I think, a summons to be here to give evidence today. Uh, and to produce a witness statement, is that correct? Yes, I do. And you have it with you? Yes. I tender the summons. Exhibit 3.33 will be the summons to Mr Snell. I think also, Mr Snell, you have signed a witness statement under uh, relating to the Royal Commission's rubric 3-8, dated the 15th of May 2018, is that correct? Yes, I have. Um, do you have a clean copy of that witness statement with you in the witness box? Yes. And do you also have the exhibits to that witness statement? Yes, I have. To hand beside you in the witness box. Are the contents of that witness statement true and correct to the best of your belief? Yes. Thank you. I tender that witness statement. Exhibit 3.34, witness statement of Mr Snell concerning rubric 3-8. And I also tender the exhibits too. And the exhibits will form part of the uh, exhibit. That's it. That's the evidence. Thank you. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Snell, you're the General Manager for Performance, Product and Governance at the Bank of Queensland? Yes. And you've held that role since last year, is that right? Yes. But you've been at Bank of Queensland since 2012? Yes. And what were the other roles that you held at Bank of Queensland before this one? General Manager of Corporate Property and Agribusiness for the majority of that time. Right. And could you just explain to the Commissioner the nature of your role as Head of Performance, Product and Governance? Uh, yes, so there's three different areas there. The, the first one being performance. Uh, it's looking at the, uh, the use of capital and the, and the, the right, uh, right product for the right, uh, right time. It also looks at uh, working closer with our finance partners and how our divisions uh, are performing against our expected outcomes. Our product is, is developing, remediating and ensuring our product is, is as good as it can be for the clients. And lastly, governance, where I have a team that look after operational risk and compliance for the BOQ business division. And who do you report to, Mr I, Snell? I report to Brendan White, who's the group executive of BOQ business. Okay. And who does Mr White report to? To the uh, CEO, John Sutton. Now, I just want to understand one part of the role, which is governance a little better. Mm -hmm. Is your role in charge of governance separate from the internal risk function of the Bank of Queensland? Yes, my role is around the, the operational risk and compliance for the people within our business and the delivery of product and services to clients. And does sorry, that... Mr. Snell, do you mind just keeping your voice up a bit? Yep, sorry. thank you. So there's a separate internal risk function within Bank of Queensland? Yes, there's multiple. Uh, there's credit risk, so decisioning for transactions, and there's also the compliance and operational risk for the group. Okay. And who is responsible for carrying out the audits of the branches of Bank of Queensland? Uh, they they report to a, a gentleman by the name of Mark Rhodes, but that rolls into the chief risk officer of, of the bank. Okay, and that's obviously separate from your role? Yes, yes. And who does the Chief Risk Officer report to? To their CEO. Okay. Are you familiar with the audits that are carried out in relation to branches? I, I'm familiar um, in particular into the credit risk review and around the commercial lending product because obviously being, being product for commercial lending, I have some responsibility. Um, I'm not familiar with the entire process when it comes to branch, uh, branch responsibilities. And when it comes to the credit risk review, what, is the, what are the particular things that branches are audited for in that respect? Uh, it would be similar to what we are audited for. So it's the delivery of product, which, which goes from 
origination through to to completion. So uh, the interaction with the client, the completion of the required documentation, the delivery of uh, expected uh, information from clients, uh, the credit assessment, and then the uh, the delivery of that to credit risk for their assessment. Now you heard the evidence given by Ms Riches yesterday afternoon? Yes. And you've been put forward by Bank of Queensland as the witness for the Royal Commission to respond to Ms Riches' evidence? Yes. I'm going to come in due course to dealing with the specifics of Ms Riches' case, but what I'd like to do first is to just go through some aspects of Bank of Queensland's business lending to understand what changes have happened over the last five years, just in relation to the market, we'll come to other aspects of changes in due course. If we bring up paragraph 29 of your statement, which is boq.0001.0087.0008, Yes. That will come up on the screen in a moment, but the proportion of gross lending by Bank of Queensland that comprises business lending has risen over the last five years from, we can see there, 17.3% to 20.6%. Yes. And does that reflect any particular plan or intention on the part of Bank of Queensland to try to build up its business lending section proportionally with respect to the rest of its lending? Yes. Uh, when when uh, Brendan White and myself joined in 2012, uh, the then CEO had a strategic imperative for us to diversify uh, our exposures by both geography, industry and asset class. And this reflects the implementation of that strategy? Yes. So we employed people in other states to diversify our book. And in terms of what's covered here by business lending, this is something that Bank of Queensland breaks down into a few different tiers, is that right? Yes. And could you just explain to the Commissioner what the tiers are by which Bank of Queensland considers business lending? Um, we have uh, SME, which would we, we, we break into two different divisions, one being under a million and then under five million, then corporate being above five million, uh, property, which is both uh, investment and development, uh, so specific to properties, and agribusiness, which is encompassing. Within the branches who sell, oh, sorry, who um, service uh, commercial lending, they are tiered as well by by experience and knowledge, and that that's tiering is one million, two and a half, and five million. And let's just focus for a moment on SME lending. You said you break, Bank of Queensland breaks it down in relation to SME lending into, was it under a million and between one million and five million? Yes. And does Bank of Queensland have standard form contracts that it uses for lending to those SME customers? Yes. Do those standard form co contracts vary depending upon whether the lending is for under a million or between one million and five million? Not, not unless specifically required. And if we then come over the page to page dot zero zero one one. There's some tables here that set out the changes in business lending applications submitted and approved between 2012 and 2017. We just want to make sure we've understood this correctly. In the year ending 2012, Bank of Queensland's estimate is that there were 4,242 applications for business loan or business credit facilities submitted, is that right? Yes. And that isn't limited to, it's not small to medium enterprise, it's just any business lending? Yes. And of those, 3,309 were approved. We can see that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the average, approximate average value then was $878,414. Yes. And then by 2017, it appears that you were able to break your data down to a slightly more granular level. Is that right? Yes. 
and you've divided it up into BOQ business and BOQ retail. Are you able to say anything about what sort of loans would fall into each of those sections? Uh, yes, so the retail network, as I touched on, uh, are able to lend up to certain tiers. And we have a commercial lending model that dictates or directs them uh, into what they do should it fall outside that model. So if it's over uh, the one million, two and a half or five, they'll refer it to business banking. Uh, and then the business banking will um, obtain business over that amount as well. So um, if we just focus on that for a moment, because this might give us an, under an opportunity to understand the way in which branches are authorised. It's possible that a branch would have no authorisation to make a business loan or to approve a business loan, is that right? Uh, yeah, branches can't approve and nor can business or all of our, our loans are approved by our credit department for a business loan. That's but right. they can an, an originate, i.e. Uh, work with a client who may have a, an exposure of 800,000 and they can go through the process um, of originating that loan, yes. I understand, I should have put that very badly. But the way in which it works is if a borrower comes to a Bank of Queensland branch and says, I want to borrow a million dollars, then if the relevant branch has authority to originate a loan of up to a million dollars, then they can be the one who handles the processing of that loan to begin with before it goes to credit approval. Yes. But if they have no authority to originate the loan of up to a million dollars, they just refer it on to BOQ business. Yes. And so this information is really just telling us from where the loan is originated. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And within the branches, the various authority levels you indicated were 1 million, 2.5 million and 5 million. Is that right? Yes. And as I think we already agreed, it's also possible that a branch would have no authority to originate a business loan. Is that right? <coughs> yes. And in which case, that whatever business lending came in, they would have to refer off to BOQ business. Yes, but that's very small. Um, so I'm just going to think about this for a second. I believe we do have a million dollars origination for all branches. However, um, a lot of the smaller branches that don't do business lending often will, will automatically refer it. All right. And when we're referring to these levels of authority of the BOQ branches, are we only talking about the owner-manager branches or are we talking about both owner-manager and corporate branches? At this time, corporate branches are capped at one million and owner-manager branches are tiered. Okay. And if we then just explain, or if you can just explain to the commissioner, one of the unique features of the Bank of Queensland model is that it has franchised out its branches. Is that right? Yes. And the, at present, as we understand it, a little over 60% of Bank of Queensland branches are franchised. Is that right? Yes to what Bank of Queensland refers to as owner managers. Yes. And we'll come in due course to some of the detail of how that works, but just to focus on this lending approval, I'm sorry, lending origination authority, the owner manager branches will have this authority of up to a million, up to two and a half million or up to five million, is that right? Yes. And that system of up to a million, up to 2.5 million, or up to 5 million, how long has that been in place? Uh, I believe 2014, when the commercial lending model was updated. Okay. And before 2014, was there a period of time when all authority to, all delegated authority in relation to business lending was withdrawn from the branches? Uh, when I joined BOQ, I removed all delegating lending authorities for business banking and we removed them from the branches. So prior to that, they could approve or originate and assess certain loans, but that was removed, yes. And you removed that in 2012 when you joined? No, I th it actually was, was removed in about early 14. Okay. And that was the decision that you made? For the business bank, yes. And did it reflect 
a more general decision that was made within the bank? Yeah, I, I think it reflected uh, a view that myself and, and some of the newer credit managers at BOQ um, oh. wanted to align closer to market. Wanted to what, sorry? Align closer to what we had seen at other institutions. And what does that mean exactly? Um, effectively uh, making sure that a, there is a segregation in terms of who originates and who assesses. I understand. So the, when you withdrew the authority to approve, mm -hmm. it was still possible for the branches to originate the loans? They had delegated authorities under tiering from uh, base to level four, and they could have uh, approved under that. Um, when I spoke to some of the more senior branches at the time, they actually hadn't applied for it because they were um, keen to have a second set of eyes so go through the standard credit authority, uh, credit assessment process. So yes, they could though, yes. I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I've quite understood that they could have done what? No, as you said, they could approve um, loans under a delegated authority. Yes, I'm sorry, I, if we just break this down. Before you withdrew the delegated authority, they could actually approve loans up to a certain amount if they had the delegated authority. Yes. And after you withdrew the authority, they could no longer approve loans, that's the first point? Uh, they could approve a cash back guarantee for 100,000 and cars up to 150,000, but actual loans, business loans, no. And they could still originate loans though? Yes. And there was separate authority limits in relation to what level of loans they could originate? Yes. Okay. And are they reflected by what we're talking about now, the one million, two and a half million and five million? Yes. That change all happened at the same time? Uh, it was around the same time. Yep. And so to come back to what we were looking at in terms of this change in data, the data seems to suggest that in the last five years, the total value of loans submitted and approved by the BAQ business has fallen. Do you agree with that? So you're saying loans from BOQ that were business loans? That's right. Yes. yes. Has fallen. Yes. And having regard to what we were looking at a moment ago, which is that the percentage of lending that it comprises business lending has increased, are you able to explain, does that just indicate that the total gross loans made by BOQ has also fallen over the last five years? I believe so. And does Bank of Queensland have a view as to why it is that the submitted and approved business loans have fallen over the last five years? Uh, yes, I'd probably put it down to two things. Uh, one being the, <coughs> the introduc introduction of competition. So the, uh, uh, the fintechs or other institutions where uh, their delivery into that uh, smaller micro area has, is, is a lot easier. Um, so I think we're not as competitive in that area. And, uh, and I think with the education and, and some of the other um, things we've put into place in the bank, we're, we're looking to be more of a niche player. So we're looking at larger um, and more sophisticated loans per client. I see, and that perhaps is reflected in the fact that the average approved value has risen by more than 50%. Yes. So Bank of Queensland is repositioning its business lending to focus on perhaps a slightly narrower segment than what it had previously focused on. Yes. And in terms of what that segment or what those segments are, are you able to explain to the commissioner where they lie, what the focus is now? Uh, yes, we, <clears throat> we have a, a number of targeted um, sectors, which would be uh, hospitality, um, including uh, clubs and hotels, uh, agribusiness, uh, franchise and um, general property. Um, however, we don't preclude all other business, but that's the niche sectors. Oh, sorry, and health and retirement. And it, it sounds like some of those sectors at least would still be SME lending sectors. They'd still be under 5 million lending. Yeah, there will be clients and, and uh, lending that span the spectrum, yes. But could you comment for us 
is Bank of Queensland's focus now less on lending under $5 million or has it not changed? No, I, I think we've just focused a little bit more on some of those sophisticated uh, larger than $5 million and, uh, and we've, we've um, coupled that with employing people with experience. An example is agribusiness where we have a, a stated uh, appetite to be more than $3 million if possible. And again, just to explain so the Commissioner gets some sense of what's happening in the market, what's the reason for having a desire to be lending over $3 million in agribusiness? Uh, we are, we're a smaller bank and uh, we can't always have the, uh, we don't have the resources to go head to head with a lot of the larger and we like to have more personalised relationships. We're not a transactional, we, we, we believe we're a relationship banker. So those clients that uh, are over three million might be multi-generational farmers and, and they're the ones we like to have relationships with. And is that likely to then mean there's a geographical focus on Queensland or is it going to go beyond Queensland, it's just agribusiness in general? No, at the moment we have uh, offices in Queensland and New South Wales. Now I want to move then to the particular loan that we're concerned with in this case study, which is the loan to Sue Rich. Mm -hmm. That was a loan originated out of the, what was the Piri Street branch in Adelaide? Yes. And that was an owner manager branch? Yes. And that's now been closed down? Yes. And you've obviously gone through and reviewed the information that Bank of Queensland has available about the loan? Yes. You obviously were not involved in the loan at all, which make Correct. that clear at the yep. beginning. And you've not been able to talk to the owner manager or the former owner manager about what happened in relation to the loan? Correct. And could you explain to the commissioner why that is? I understand we haven't been able to get in contact. But. And perhaps then I'll just lead you through what you put in your statement. Yep. That owner manager was terminated by Bank of Queensland? Yes. He was terminated in 2013, the year after the loan that was originated in this case? Yes, he was. And he was terminated because he misappropriated customer funds? Yes. But not the this customer's funds? Not the customer, no. I'm sorry, what? No, yeah, you're right, not this customer's funds. And what happened was there was an internal audit carried out by Bank of Queensland and that discovered that, I think you say in your statement, a total of $156,000 had been misappropriated from two customer accounts. Is that right? Um, I'd have to double check with the statement, but I... It's so paragraph 144 of your statement. It's on page dot zero zero four six. Yes. <coughs> and the point you make in paragraph 145 is, given his termination, you've not had access to him? Yes, yeah, so we terminated him and referred him to the police. Now, I want to ask you some questions about the internal auditing approach at the time. Bank of Queensland would carry out audits of the owner-manager branches, is that right? Yes. And I understand from your statement that what happens now is that the audits are ordinarily carried out every three years? That yes, right? that, well, they're on a, a rolling basis, but a minimum three years. Sorry, minimum three years, did you I say? Believe, I believe so, yes. All right, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So there, it's rolling audits, that's the yep. first point? Of, yes. And is that of both the owner-manager branches and the corporate branches, or just the owner-manager branches? I, well, my understanding is all, all, all branches and all business banking portfolios are audited. And the audits are carried out on a minimum three years as part of the rolling term ordinarily? I believe so. But if there's a unsatisfactory, if there's a failure to pass, then in that case, the 
audit is then carried out again the following year? I believe there'll be, there'll be um, outcomes that are required to be actioned within a certain period of time. And depending on the, uh, the reason for the fail, it could be as, as fresh uh, as recent as six months afterwards. I see. And there's, perhaps we should just break this down, there's three different grades that a branch can get on the audit? Yes, yeah, so that, at that period of time that, that was the case, yes. And could you just explain to the Commissioner what those three grades are? Um, unsatisfactory, needs improvement and satisfactory. And so if there was an unsatisfactory grade, then an audit would be carried out again within a year, is that mm. right? Yes. And if there was a needs improvement, then an audit would be carried out within two years. Is that right? Uh, well, not, you're not sure. Not 100% sure on that. It, it, I think needs improvement, because it's a very broad um, uh, result, it would depend on what was required, so what was identified and what, what remediation or what training was required. OK. And then otherwise, it's part of the rolling schedule. Yes. And Bank of Queensland had carried out one of these or carried out an audit on the Piri Street branch in 2012. <coughs> Have you looked at that document? Sorry, is that oh, in It's not in your statement. statement. Right. Has anybody shown yes, that? Yes, yeah. Oh, I, I understood there was audits conducted in 2010 and 2012, yes. All right, we might just bring up the 2012 one, BOQ.0001.0033.5135. So this, you've seen this document before? Yes. Yes. And this was a, this was the credit risk review on the 2nd of July, 2012 for this branch? Yes. And is this, is this the audit report or would there be some other document that was prepared? There would be a more detailed report okay. um, illustrating the certain classifications. All right, so if we just have a look for a moment at the credit risk report, you see the current result for credit risk quality is marginal? Yes. And can you explain what that means, what it says about the process at the branch? It would mean that they haven't followed all the um, <clears throat> policies and processes required for credit risk. All right. And then you see the credit risk process review, overall review result is a fail? Yes. And can you explain what that means? Uh, it's, it's more holistic from the first one and it covers a, a few more areas within the uh, credit risk. All right. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.35, 2012 Credit Risk Review, Piri Street Branch, BOQ, 0001 0033 uh, 5135. Can we bring up BOQ.0001.0066.0199? Now this is the commercial credit risk review that was done in 2013. You can see that? Yes. And again, is this, just so I understand, is this the audit document or would you expect there's some separate, more detailed document that's done in addition to this? Uh, this is the first page of multiple, which would have more detail around it. All right. And but it, there's not some separate document. There's just one document in this case. Um, I, I believe so. Okay. And then you see that the previous, that is for July 2012, the result is a fail? Yes. And is that just reflecting what we saw in that preceding document, or is that reflecting a conclusion that you think would have been drawn in a 
a different additional document from 2012. The answer may be you're not sure. I'm not sure. Right. And in any event, the issue that was, or one of the issues that was identified, if you look over in the executive summary, is material weaknesses were identified in documentation and settlement as it was not evident from the files reviewed that conditions precedent are being addressed? Yes. That. And at the end of the fourth paragraph, whilst on some files management could talk to the current state of some exposures, the consistent use of diary memos is encouraged to record material interactions and to demonstrate proactive credit risk management? Yes. And. Is it fair to say, oh, I'm sorry, we should just go over to boq.0001.0066.0203. That's just, thank you. And you see the risk observation is, this is the third unsatisfactory or fail result in a row and strong management of the situation by all appropriate stakeholders is required to ensure the branch returns to an effective standard of control and risk management. Yes. And this being the third one, and we've seen the second one, which is 2012, do you think that the first one, based on your review of documents, was in 2010? Yes. Okay. So there'd been audits that have been carried out, as you understood it, of this branch in 2010, 2012 and 2013, all of which showed either an unsatisfactory or fail result. Is that right? Yes. From memory, it was uh, unsatisfactory or fail in 10, an improved position in 11 and then a deterioration again in 12. All right. And one of the issues was that there was inexperience on the part of the loans officer at the branch? I believe so. If it assists you, perhaps, I'm sorry, I'll tender that document, Commissioner. If it's 3.36, Group Assurance Commercial Credit Risk Review, Piri Street Branch 2013, BOQ 0001 0066019. And can we just go back to the preceding document, which is BOQ.0001.0033.5135. And go over to the second page, dot five one three six. And if we just, thank you, pop out the review observations, you'll see it says the loans officer is still very inexperienced in commercial lending and accordingly closer attention is needed from the owner manager combined with increased oversight from the regional manager. Is that, that's an observation we've noted as to the inexperience. Have you, did you observe other observations to that effect in your review of documents? Uh, no, but I have seen that observation. All right. And as we understand it then, there was only one loans officer operating at the branch? In conjunction with the owner manager, yes. And that's not unusual to have only one loans officer at an owner manager branch? No, the, the owner managers, uh, depending on their, their flow of uh, business, their number of clients would determine how many, client, uh, how many staff they require. And the loans officer who's being referred to here is the loans officer who prepared the suitability assessments for Ms. Richards? They were involved in the process, I believe. Yes. Well. It must have been either them and the owner manager or yeah, yes. them by themselves who prepared the suitability assessment, is that right? Yes. And then that would be sent up to the credit department? Yes. Now, perhaps just before we go to the loan itself, there was a a warning letter that was sent to the branch in 2012. Have you seen that? Yes. If we bring that up, it's boq.0001.0033.5135. 
So this was the letter sent by the bank to the owner manager of the branch. Is that right? Yes. And this is following that commercial credit risk review that we've already looked at for 2012? Yes. And it notes that there was an overall fail result and then identifies some issues which are said to be serious and require attention as outlined below. What's, what's the nature of this letter? Does it have some significance under the owner-manager contract as you understand it? Uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, effectively it's calling out behaviours that uh, aren't meeting the requirements under the owner-manager agency agreement. And uh, if there's a breach and multiple breaches, uh, that can have ramifications to the owner-manager. Well, if we turn over the page to .4711, You'll see at the end of the page, it says failure to achieve a past result in the agency's next commercial credit risk review and complying with the policy in future may result in a formal breach notice being issued. Yes. So this is not a formal breach notice, is that right? No, it's a warning. All right. And we know that there was a problem again in 2013 with the audit, but it came up as unsatisfactory rather than as a fail? Yes. So it doesn't appear as if a formal breach notice would have been issued or was issued as a result of the auditing in 2013? I can't recall, but, but it, doesn't, any it event, doesn't appear so. But in any event, in 2013, the, brand, the owner manager was terminated because of the misappropriation? Yes. And do you know or are you able to say these types of, these issues with the owner, ma or this owner manager branch as at 2012, were they unusual compared to other owner manager branches that BOQ had? Unfortunately, I can't say. I wasn't involved in that. You weren't what, sorry? I wasn't involved with the branches. All right. You weren't time. involved with looking at the overall performance? Not at that time, no. Okay. Not now. But you are now? No. Okay. Now, in this case, the in, that is in respect of Ms Rich, the loan was originated under the Commercial Lending Origination Authority. Would that yes. be right? Yeah. And actually, I'm sorry, I should have tendered that document, Commissioner. It was 3.37 letter BOQ to the owner manager, Perry Street Branch, 10 December 12, BOQ 0001 0033 4710, exhibit 3.37. And the commercial <laughs> lending originating authority is something that's set out in BOQ's commercial lending referring model? Yes. And you've exhibited the current version of the referral model to your statement? Yes. Do you know whether it's changed materially or at all over the last five years? It uh, changed in 2013, I believe. I've just spilled water over many pieces of electronics. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have to deal with that. Uh, <laughs> and. <laughs> What's the, what's the change that happened in 2013? Uh, <clears throat> we, we changed the levels. So prior to 2013, experienced branches uh, or branches that have been there a long time had larger limits than the five million. Um, we put some rigor around the property development in particular. Um, other than that, it, it was just making sure that there's referrals to BOQ business where we felt it was required. And the branches would have, as you've explained already, some originating authority as to, in any event, in 2012, as to what they could originate? Yes. 
and this particular branch, as we understand it, had no, it didn't have delegated authority to approve commercial loans? No, I believe they had a base level, which is exactly as you say, no authority other than the guarantees and the cars and a few small things. Yep. Yes, so they couldn't approve an actual loan. No. And, but they did have the authority to be able to originate a loan? Originate and manage, absolutely. And so in this case, when they were originating the loan and managing it, that was within their authority? Yes. And the loans officer would be required to undertake the serviceability, the initial serviceability assessment of the loan? Yes, so between the loans and officer and the uh, branch manager, they would look to consolidate all the data, put it together with a loan application and the serviceability and send that to credit for assessment. Right. And that's what happened in this case, it seems, whether it's the I loans officer so. or the owner manager, branch, owner manager of the branch, and then it's reviewed by credit. Yes. And you say in your statement if we bring up paragraph 143 on page boq.0001.0087.0046. If we pop out paragraph 143, you say, from the outset, BOQ accepts that there was maladministration in the serviceability and capacity assessment performed by BOQ and breach of Bank of Queensland's obligation to lend responsibly in the origination of the loan to Sue Rich. I want to just make sure we've understood the nature of the acknowledgement as it is today. Internally, there was an identification of some errors that had been made on the loan. You're aware of that? On the serviceability? Yes. Yes. And there were also identification of certain errors by FOS in the course of its determination? Yes. And it appears as if those errors don't entirely overlap. Are you aware of that? In terms of the serviceability errors? Yes. Yes. And so that we can be clear, does Bank of Queensland acknowledge that all of, the error, all of the errors identified internally were errors it made in relation to serviceability? Yes. And it, it acknowledges that all of the errors identified by FOS in relation to serviceability were errors that gave rise to maladministration? It agreed, yes. All right. And I think our count, but you tell us if you have a different view about it, is that Bank of Queensland had internally initially identified three errors that it had made in relation to serviceability. Yes. And FOS seems to have identified four, one of which overlaps with the Bank of Queensland errors. I thought there were two that overlapped. Oh, perhaps yeah. if we go through it. So if we bring up paragraph 195 of Mr Snell's statement, that's on page dot zero zero five six. So if we pop that out, these are the three errors that were identified on an initial perusal of the file in 2014. Mm -hmm. and the first is an amount for depreciation was included in the profit and loss figure, but not included, but no corresponding expense was included in the profit and loss statement. Yes. The second was the living allowance was calculated as if Ms. Richards was single when in fact she was married. Yes. And the third was that her PAYG salary tax liability had been understated. Yes. And we'll just bring up the FOS determination.
while that's coming up, let me ask you a question about interest rate buffers. Mm -hmm. Because this does tie, you, you are aware that FOS expressed a view about what the appropriate interest rate buffer was? Yes. And it expressed the view that the appropriate interest rate buffer was 3%? Yes. You've explained in your statement that the, the Bank of Queensland at the moment, I think, is using an interest rate buffer of 2.25%. Yes. Does Bank of Queensland have a view as to the appropriateness of a particular interest rate buffer? Uh, well, <clears throat> as evidence, we've, we've changed our buffer. Um, to, to be closer aligned to what we think the market requires. Sorry, did you say to reflect what? Well, we, we assess uh, market volatility in the buffer, um, but we also take guidance from regulators, for example, the 7.25 at the moment for home loans. Well, that's something I'm just interested in trying to tease out to understand how relevant this is in relation to business loans. APRA publishes certain guidance in relation to home loan lending and what buffer ought to be allowed, is that right? Mm -hmm. So just because it's being recorded? Oh, I believe so. Mm -hmm. And you may not be familiar with the detail of this, Mr Snell. Are you, if I ask you questions about interest rate buffers, am I taking you well outside of your comfort zone? I probably won't be able to answer accurately on behalf of the bank. <laughs> That's all right. Let's, let's bring up the determination which is boq.0001.0023.0001. And if we go to the page dot zero five three eight. So these are the four serviceability issues that had been identified in the FOS recommendation. See that starting about a third of the way down the page? Yes. So the first error was that Bank of Queensland had included the add back of depreciation, which is the same error that we looked at a moment ago that had been identified internally by Bank of Queensland. Yes. Yes. And then the second error is this issue about interest rate buffers. You see that there? Yes. And the third issue is that the wrong term was used for the home loans, that a term of 30 years was used when the home loans were for 25 years. Yes. And the fourth issue was that Bank of Queensland did not appear to have given any consideration to make an allowance for the bank guarantee. Yes. And it may be, to be fair to you, that Bank of Queensland hasn't needed to turn its mind or talk to you about which of these particular points it accepts that FOS was right about. Is that fair? No, I haven't had that discussion. And the reason for that, and we'll come to this in a moment, is the recommendation found that there was maladministration in relation to the loan. That's yes. right? Yes. And Bank of Queensland did not challenge the recommendation. It accepted the recommendation. Yes. And that was because well before the recommendation was made, Bank of Queensland had already identified that there was maladministration in the loan. Yes. So that whether the particular points that had been picked up by FOS were right or not was never something that Bank of Queensland really needed to turn its mind to. I think we would have had a conversation if they were vastly different. Um, so although the topics are different, they're the amount changes were quite similar to what we uh, we identified as definitely the uh, errors that were made. Well, I think, and again, if we just think that through, the 
issues that whatever the errors are in relation to serviceability, the consequence of it is that had the serviceability calculation been done properly, then the loan would not have been made. Yes. And Bank of Queensland had figured that out well before it received the FOS recommendation. It appeared that way. And once it was decided that the loan should not have been made, there's the consequences of what follows from that don't depend on what the errors were in serviceability, do they? I don't believe so. It's just that there's then consequences in terms of it shouldn't have been made, therefore FOS has a standard way of dealing with that sort of situation. Uh, I'm not sure if it's standard, but they certainly give recommendation and determination, yes. All right. And then... If we then... Sorry, Commissioner, I should say that document doesn't need to be tendered. It's already part of the exhibits to the statement. Now, I just want to then come back to this idea that we were looking at in your statement that Bank of Queensland identified and acknowledged its maladministration to faults. That's what you say in your statement? Yes. And I want to be clear about what you mean by that. When do you say that Bank of Queensland acknowledged its maladministration to FOS? I believe it was uh, after the recommendation. I see, after the recommendation. I believe, right. I'd have to check though. Um, right. I mean, the, the bank was aware that uh, the branch had made mistakes. And in terms of the actual process by which Ms Richards ended up with her loan, as you know, there was a conditional letter of offer that was given by the owner manager to Ms Richards. Yes, I believe there's one on the 20th and one on the 27th of August. And the amount or indicative monthly repayment in relation to that was roughly half of what ultimately turned out to be the interest payment? Yes, that document stated around four, four and a half thousand dollars, four thousand three. And as I understand your statement, you say Bank of Queensland's position is that uh, the branch manager had no authority to be able to give that conditional letter of offer to, in any event? Yes, so there were Two things that sort of came to uh, came to light in that in the investigation is Ms. Richards um, alleged that she had a conversation with the branch and he committed verbally to a approved loan, which um, un isn't uh, documented or we don't know. Uh, and then he issued a breach, uh, sorry, a letter of conditional letter of offer outside of his authority, which is a breach of policy. Yes. Right. And as I understand it, Bank of Queensland has it doesn't have any ability to dispute that that conversation occurred? No, we have no records. You have no records. One of the points that was picked up in the internal audit of this branch was that there was a failure to keep sort of notes and memos in relation to credit? Yes. Yep. This branch manager in any event breached a different policy by even handing over the conditional letter of offer? Yes. All right. And the other striking thing about the conditional letter of offer is that it doesn't explain that the lease term would need to be seven years in order for, this lo for a loan to be made with these interest or principal and interest repayments of only $4,500. Yeah, sure, correct. And that's what I got identified by the risk assessor at a later time. And so what happened is the owner manager had given the conditional letter of offer to Ms Richards, which didn't say anything about the seven years, submitted the loan for, as the originator, submitted the loan for approval to the credit risk officer who had to knock it back. Uh, the credit risk officer uh, looked, at the, looked at the detail he was provided with and, and noticed that the uh, duration of the leases was shorter than the term of the loan. So yes, he sent it back for for a further review. 
and the Bank of Queensland policy was that you couldn't lend out on a business loan where it's buying a business in a leased premises for longer than the lease. Yes, that was the guideline. So this was just in accordance with the Bank of Queensland policy? Yes. And that's, I'm sure you would Normal say, practice. entirely understandable. You don't want to be lending out against a business that, where the loan has to be repaid over eight years, but the business could theoretically not be able to continue to operate from the premises after three years. Yes. And the other part of this is if the loan had, I'm sorry, if the lease had an option, then the term, the period provided for under the option could have been taken into account? It certainly would have been taken into account, yes. And so that could have made a difference as well. It's just that there wasn't an option in this case. Yeah, yes. Although the one thing that was taken into account was that the shops had been there for some 20 years and they had been leased out continually. And what, sorry? That the leases had been rolled for that during that 20 year period. So that was taken into account. However, as you've alluded to, the leases were shorter than seven years. Yes. And the response came back from the credit officer back to the owner manager, which is, we're not prepared to lend. Uh, on the on basis, that basis. Yes. And there's nothing that would indicate that the owner manager then told Ms. Richards about this. Uh, not in the records I've seen. And it then appears that the owner manager tried to or did directly contact Wendy's, the franchisor. I believe they had a conversation with the legal representative at Wendy's, yes. And it appears as if the bank manager was trying to negotiate some sort of was it an extra extension or option for the benefit of Ms Richards? Uh, from reading the, the transcript, I get a sense that he was trying to understand whether or not there would be any extension approved before the signing of the contract, yes. And I'm interested in this. Is that what you would regard as normal behaviour for a branch manager? Uh, there are times when the, the relationship manager will do assist the client, whether it be contacting external parties or not. Normal is a hard thing to say because it's quite broad. Presumably you wouldn't expect him to be doing it without having first sought the agreement of the client. To, to act on their behalf, yes. And it seems as if a danger of a branch manager taking this sort of approach is that the banker is taking on some role that goes beyond being merely a banker and is starting to act as an advisor or assistant to the customer, do you agree? Yes, knowing that in this case the client had told the banker that she was using advisors as well. But yes. Well, that's, that's true, that in this case, the client had advisors. What I'm interested in is an important issue for the commission is the personal responsibility of a borrower. If the bank manager starts becoming involved in this way in transactions, do you have a view about whether the danger that is presented by that is that it erodes the idea that the bank and the small potential small business owner are operating at arm's length and entirely independently of each other in their own interests? Uh, I have a view that um, at times the bankers may have experienced that, that uh, maybe the business owner, whether that be a small business or a corporate, um, may have may have different levels of experience, so there may be an agreement to assist. Uh, and there are times in corporate banking or institutional banking where that certainly occurs. And could you just explain that a little bit more, for, perhaps if you break it down and start with corporate banking? Uh, so in, in my experience <clears throat> with uh, some of the clients we deal with, um, 
in negotiations of transactions and the like. They'll, they'll ask the bank to assist in the process, but we will be an invited party. Um, but as you've alluded to here, the, the small business client had their own advisors, so arm's length transactions or an invitation to ensure that it's specific to a topic would be probably appropriate. What I'm interested in is, and it's more general than this particular case, and that is in drawing a hard line or any line between when the, or at the point when the responsibility of the banker for the interests of the customer ends. Do you think that if the bank manager is becoming involved in dealing directly with a franchisor, that pushes the line so that the level of responsibility of the banker increases beyond what it ought to be or would normally be? Uh, that's a <clears throat> it's a very broad question, and I, and I think there's lots of different answers and lots of different ways. But I, I would say specifically that as long as it's evidenced and the reason why and the banker's experience is clearly articulated, then, then I would see that as being an acceptable outcome. However, segregation of duties within the bank to ensure that the right people are doing the right things and, uh, and the relationship with the client to ensure, as you've alluded to, to an extent it has to be arm's length, but otherwise they, ha they are working together. The Actually, I might just, I'm sorry, I will persist with this, Mr. Snell. I, and what I want to try to get you to help us with is it will be said inevitably that a small business owner or potential owner has to take responsibility and personal responsibility for their own well-being and taking responsibility for that well-being is not the role of the bank. You, I mean, that's a, one would think, entirely conventional and legally understandable approach to the relationship between banker and small business owner. Do you agree? That will be said because our, our role is primarily to assist them in getting funding, yes. That's right. And the bank is acting in its interests. It is seeking to... When it assesses credit, what it's trying to do is make sure that ultimately it will get repaid and that's the approach that it takes. It's not whatever the advertising campaigns might be, the bank is not the friend of the small business owner, it's, their, it's a commercial transaction. There's probably a, a line there in terms of we are a part of the relationship, we feel, because we do provide services that assist them in, in running their day-to-day -day business. Um, internet banking, for example, is a, a good example where people use that tool to, to run their business. But uh, you are correct in terms of well, there is a line where we wish we, we, the, the relationship with the banker and advisor are definitely separate. And they should each be expected to be taking care of their own interests? Uh, there's a, there is a joint relationship, obviously, debt versus equity, um, but, but we are we are party to the, to the uh, relationship. But yes, the, everybody has their responsibilities within the relationship. And the banker is not the financial advisor of the small business owner? No. And not the lawyer of the small business owner? No and not the accountant of the small business owner? No. And small business owners can go and access any of those people if they want financial advice or legal advice or accounting advice? Yes. And if they want somebody to negotiate with a franchisor on their behalf, they can use their lawyer, they can get a broker, they can get a commercial agent, or they can do it themselves? Yes. And it seems then as if once the banker steps in and starts dealing directly with the franchisor about the franchisor's relationship with the small business owner, that the banker is taking on a new role and a new responsibility. Do you agree with that? In this specific case, I think the banker should have asked the client to talk to them, 
Yeah. I, I don't mean, let's set aside, we're talking more generally now, so let's set okay. aside this particular case and what the banker should do before they decide to do that. But if they get the permission of the small business owner and if they do it, that is talk to a franchisor about the relationship between the franchisor and the small business owner, do you agree that the banker then seems to be taking on some new relationship and responsibility in relation to the small business owner? It's a hard one because you've said franchisor and franchisee and, and our branch managers are, are owner managers, i.e. franchisees. So there is an expectation that they would have a level of experience. So in this case, maybe, um, but generally there, there's, a, there's a line and I, and I don't know, it's, it's not a hard line and, and I don't think it's been determined, but there's definitely a, a place where we have to be careful as to wh where we're um, crossing the boundaries of what's too close uh, and, and not independent. And it, it seems, and I'm sure you would say this, it's not as if you can, you can't regulate what that line is by government stepping in. That would be your view. No, I think the culture of the bank and the, and the rules within the bank, so the policies would regulate that. And if the bank decides to adopt as either a formal or informal policy that it's permissible for a banker to, with the permission of the borrower, putative borrower, to speak directly to the franchisor about the nature of the relationship between the franchisor and the borrower, then that's a matter for the culture of the bank. I suppose yes. And the one reason why the bank might decide to do that and step beyond the arm's length role is because of the point you've made, which is the bankers might have a lot of experience with dealing with different types of business transactions, much more experience than that of the small business owner. They may, yes. And it's to the benefit of the small business owner if the banker can give the small business owner the benefit of his or her experience. Seems that way. And insofar as that involves some potential increased level of risk for the bank because of the possibility of that it might be said in the future, well, now you had a particular duty to me and you breached it, that's, again, something for the bank to take on and manage. I believe so. All right. Now, let's return to the specifics of what happened here, which was the serviceability worksheet was completed initially within the branch by either the inexperienced credit officer or the owner manager? Yes. And it had a number of errors, as we know? Yes. And it was submitted up to the credit department? Yes. And the credit department didn't pick up those errors? It appears not. And that was notwithstanding the fact that there'd already been an identification in the audit of the branch that year that there were issues with the credit assessments being carried out in that branch? Yes. And do you know whether if a branch was audited and there were issues identified with credit assessment from coming out of the branch, that there was then any instruction given to the Bank of Queensland Credit Department to exercise extra care or scrutiny in relation to serviceability calculations coming from such a branch? I would believe that the uh, Credit Risk Department would share that information with, sorry, the Audit Department would share that information with Credit, so they would be aware. All right, you, you, you assume that they would? Yeah, they'd have a conversation about the outcomes. Is Would the audits be distributed within the Credit Department? I don't sure. know, sorry. All right. And 
in any event, the consequence of it was that the serviceability issues were not picked up, but because of the term of the lease, the only offer that could be made was effectively on a, a loan on a three-year basis. Yes. And that was why when Ms Richards finally came into the branch to get her final letter of offer, it had now, the, the payments that she had to make had now doubled. Yes, it, it appears the uh, credit manager was more uh, focused on the duration of the leases rather than the servicing worksheet and he um, had directed the term to be three years. So the branch manager had the term adjusted and as you've as you've alluded to, yes, it, uh, it increased the uh, interest from 4,000 odd to 8,000 odd. And quite apart from the maladministration and actually calculating the loan, does Bank of Queensland accept that there was a failure on its part in relation to the original representation about a monthly payment of only four something thousand dollars? I accept that we offered the client a conditional letter of offer which illustrated that and what I can't uh, identify through the paper that the papers that I've read is whether there was any communication prior to the uh, the documentation from the seven years to three which obviously increased the interest from four to three I, I don't know whether that occurred um, but uh, if it hasn't then yes but if we just focus on that initial conditional letter of offer mm -hmm. that was obviously a failure of the branch manager to follow Bank of Queensland's processes. you agree with that? In terms of issuing the letter of offer? Yes. yes. And do you accept that if a bank gives a conditional letter of offer to a customer which says the monthly payments will be for something thousand dollars, that it would expect the customer to then rely on and order his or her affairs in accordance with that representation. And, and this is where the original challenge lies in, in terms of the original letter of offer or conditional letter of offer shouldn't have been issued. And if it had have been, it should have been post credit assessment. So we would have identified earlier that the duration would have been three years and the interest component different. And so yes, it, it stems back to that conditional letter of offer being issued. Yes, but if we just focus on what I'm interested in understanding which is, it was still a conditional letter. It mm. wasn't unconditional, that's the case. True. There were conditions that had to be met in terms of the provision of certain contracts. Yes. Presumably those are conventional conditions. Then it's not ordinarily expected, I, I'm sorry, they're conventional conditions, is that right? Yes. It wouldn't be expected that though the provision of those contracts would somehow have some effect on the monthly payment of the loan for the loan. Uh, <clears throat> probably the the, uh, the valuation would be taken into account. So the valuation of the business, the cash flow of the business. So I, th I think you're aware that they asked for management um, figures for that year to understand how the business was performing and whether it had been consistent with 2011 and 12. Um, but yeah, standard, reasonably standard documents or expectations. But again, let's just, if we can, focus on the detail of that. If the management accounts had been problematic, what would the consequence have been, if any, for the monthly payments? Oh, if they were problematic, I think there would have been a discussion with the client and with their accountant, and it may not have gone ahead. That's right. The, the loan may just not have gone ahead. Yes. As distinct from altering the monthly payments. Yes. And similarly, when it comes to the contracts that were required, mm. it wasn't. It was already known by the bank that the term of the lease was only three years. Yes. Well, it was shorter than three years, but three years was the duration, and and uh, the client accepted that on the basis that, as I said, history had shown the shop had been there for 20 years, so they were confident that they'd be able to continue. So three years was the term, yes. Sorry, uh, we may be at cross purposes here. When the conditional letter of offer was given, mm -hmm. it was already known to the bank that the term of the lease would be three years. 
I'd have to check the time. You're not sure whether no. that's the case? No. Right. But in any event, yeah, at well. some point, well before the final letter of offer was issued, it was known to the bank that the term would only be three years. Yes. Because that was the basis upon which the submission for approval was refused. It was refused at Initially. seven and the credit assessment um, suggested three years would be approved, yes. And so, Mike, to return then to this issue of providing a conditional letter of offer, mm -hmm. does the bank accept that if it provides a conditional letter of offer that says the repayments will be for something thousand dollars, that that is a representation to the client or potential client that the repayments will be for something thousand dollars? And uh, Absolutely. Again, I think that the challenge at the time was that conditional letter of offer was issued without the appropriate authority. I understand. So, yes. And does it accept that if it provides a conditional letter of offer to a client saying the loan repayments will be for something thousand dollars per month, that the client's entitled to rely upon that? Yes. And it doesn't matter that the loan offer is conditional insofar as they're concerned with what are my repayments going to be? they ought to have the comfort of proceeding on that basis. Again, I'll go back to the conditional letter of offer shouldn't have been issued on the basis it was. However, in normal case of business, when a conditional letter of offer has been issued, there would have been appropriate steps taken and then that would be relied upon, yes. Right. And so from your perspective, looking at this file, is there some failure on the part of the bank in its duty to the client that you identify with respect to the conditional letter of offer? Yes. And what is that? Uh, the inappropriate behaviour of the branch by issuing the conditional letter of offer without taking the appropriate steps of sending the file to credit assessment. Right. Now, what happened was after the loan was taken up by Ms Rich, Sue Rich immediately defaulted under the loan? Yes. And it has never been able to make a full monthly repayment? I believe so. And at the time when Sue Rich defaulted, there was no review of the loan assessment process in relation to the making of the loan? I don't believe a full assessment, no. Sorry, at the time of the default, nobody went back to look at what it actually, why this loan had been made in the first place if there was immediate default? No. And various demand letters then were sent over time by Bank of Queensland to Ms Richards? Yes. And Bank of Queensland then took or notified her that it would exercise its powers of sale under the mortgages? I believe we made that notice on the basis of the uh, vacant land and we worked with Ms Richards on that. And what happened was Bank of Queensland first took possession of the vacant land, is that right? I believe so. And then ultimately it was... We released it. Yes, you released she, it back to her and she sold it. For her to market, yes. Yes. And I think we had a window of some 90 days and 180 days later she sold the block, yes. And then in mid-2014, Ms Richards made a complaint to FOS? Yes. And it was at that point in time that Bank of Queensland investigated the loan? Yes. And I'd like to look at or understand that investigation. So can we bring up tab 112 of Mr Snell's statement, that's boq.0001.0023.0926. Um, I'm sorry, I think I've given you the wrong document number, it should be boq.0001.0023. No, I have given you the right one, dot zero nine two six.
So this is the internal complaint file note from Bank of Queensland. It appears so, yes. And you've exhibited this document to your statement? Yes. And you see it's dated the 2nd of September 2014? Yes. And it sets out the three loans at the top of the page? Yes. And then under the servicing section says, perusal of servicing completed by the branch shows the following errors, and it identifies the three errors we spoke about before? Yes. And it appears that it was then recalculated, or there was then a recalculation done by the customer relations section of the branch, of the, I'm sorry, of the bank? Yes. And when the recalculation was done confirming the errors, it changed from an initial surplus of $15,000, $15,003 to a deficiency of $11,447. Yes. And if we then go over to page two, you see in the middle of the page it said perusal of accounts show the following transactions and this indicates that the business is still operating. Yes. And it then explains what the consequence would be in FOS, which was FOS would rule ignoring reimbursements at this stage that the applicant would still be required to repay the debt would, but would be at 0% and no ongoing fees. Yes. And then you see at the bottom of the page what the applicant, that's Ms Rich's request was, which was the following compensation reimbursement. See that? Yes. And then if we go over the page, we see what the internal proposed resolution was, which was <coughs> BAQ should not reimburse the costs associated with the business purchase. And instead, there was a recommendation that an offer be made to the applicant in full and final settlement of the dispute which is various things, reduction of the business term loan principal by $56,323.33, reimburse an amount representing interest charged, reimburse an amount representing legal fees, the business term loan to be repaid at 0% with no fees, and business term loan repayments to be a certain amount per month. You see that? That's the five recommendations. Yes. yes. And Although that was the rec resolution proposed on the 2nd of September 2014, Bank of Queensland didn't make that offer to Ms Richards? No, they didn't. And do you know why that was? Uh, no, I don't. All right. Have you inquired internally as to why that was, why that decision was made? No, I have not. All right. Have you formed your own view based on your review of the documents as to why that decision was made? the proposed resolution or the decision not yes, to? Yes, why the decision was made not to go ahead with the proposed resolution. No, I haven't. No. All right. Then can we bring up the second file note? We might just, can we move that to one side of the page? The document we've currently got. And then bring up on the other side of the page the next internal review note, which is tab 119 of Mr Snell's documents, it's BOQ.0001.0023.0931. So this is a file note on the 18th of September 2014, 16 days later. See that at the top of the page, 18 September 2014? Yes. And You see in the comments section under commercial recoveries, dispute has been forwarded to commercial recoveries for perusal. 
Vanessa, presumably somebody from Commercial Recoveries, has confirmed that the debts did not service at the time of application? Yes. And so, as at the 18th of September 2014, there was no doubt at all within Bank of Queensland that first, the loan didn't service? Yes. And second, that the lo therefore the loan shouldn't have been made? Yes. All right. And then you'll see what had happened was that what's recorded is the applicant has been written to requesting an update on the current business operations. See that? Yes. And that was uh, written to by Bank of Queensland, presumably. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I believe so. And she'd responded and explained what she was doing? Yes. And then if we go over to page 3.0933, And again, this sets out like the last file note, what the applicant's request was, and then the proposed resolution. Yes. But in fact, if we then blow up the recommendations on the right-hand side, numbers one to five, and we just need to move that down slightly so we can see what's on the left-hand side as well. Move it down. That's fine. So we can see 16 days later, the recommendations remained the same, save that the amount to be reimbursed as representing interest had increased from $30,190.99 to $35,223.01. Yes, I can say that. But again, that recommendation wasn't followed? Don't believe so, no. You haven't seen any indication no. that that offer was made? No. All right. And again, you're not sure why that was? No. And then if we bring up boq.0001, we can take both of those documents down, boq.0001.0034.0006, So this is an internal email of Bank of Queensland on the 18th of September 2014 by Mr Vine, the author of the two file notes, to Sabrina Dubois. Do you know who Sabrina Dubois is? Yes. Who is she? She works within the commercial, worked in the commercial recoveries area. Commercial what? Recoveries. Recoveries, yes. Thank you. And he's attaching the response that had been received from Ms Riches was about what was going on with the franchise. And then he says, as both Vanessa and I have confirmed maladministration in lending, I will be discussing a resolution with Michelle next week. Once a resolution has been decided on, I will forward for, to you for consideration. Yes. And again, I take it from your review and whatever discussions you've had internally, you haven't been able to identify or understand why the decision was made sometime within the next few weeks not to make the offer that had been recommended? Uh, no. Right. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.38 will be email 18 September 2014, Vine to Dubois and I'm others. Sorry. I, I, I apologise, Commissioner. That's actually tab 121 to... Very well. We don't need Exhibit 3.38. Thank you. Yet. Now, can we bring up FOS.0012.0001.1932? So this is the letter from FOS to Mr. Beddoe 
at Bank of Queensland. I take it from what's set out at the top that he's the team leader of customer relations. Yes, that's correct. Would he be somebody that Mr. Vine reported to? I believe so. All right. And so Foz is writing to Bank of Queensland to set out what Foz understands is the dispute? Yes. And then if we go to the page dot one nine four one. you'll see there's issues in dispute and the first issue is did the FSP, that's Bank of Queensland, engage in irresponsible lending when it approved the business loan in October 2012? I see that, yes. And then the second question is about whether Bank of Queensland's process caused the delay of the settlement. The third is about whether Ms. Richards has incurred a loss, and the fourth is what is the appropriate resolution of the dispute? Yes. And you see then at the bottom of the page it says what you need to do now, and Bank of Queensland was asked to provide the following information, and the first one was, is my understanding of the dispute correct? If not, please provide reasons. Yes. And then if we turn over the page, was then asked for is a series or various pieces of information, including number seven, detailed basis on which lending was approved with reference to lending guidelines and or policy and information provided by applicant. Yes. All right. And then can we bring up tab 21 of Mr. Snell's exhibits, which is BAQ.0001.0036.0244. And you'll see the, this is the letter back on the 12th of December, 2014, to Bank of Queensland. Yes. I'm sorry, Commissioner, I should have tendered that letter from FOS, that's not part of Mr Snell's affidavit. Or that will be statement. Exhibit 3.3A, letter FOS to BOQ, uh, 9 December 14, FOS 0012-0011939. Thank you, Commissioner. So this is the response of Bank of Queensland to FOS's letter of the 9th of December 2014? Yes. And you see Point number one, responding to those seven questions that have been asked by FOS was, is Bank of Queensland is of the view that FOS's understanding of the dispute is correct? I see that, yes. The... Now, sorry. I'm sorry, did you want to make a comment about that, Mr Snell? Uh, no, I was just... I might, might ask later to remind myself of that understanding, but no, that's fine. Let's, let's bring it up. So if we put that document on one side and bring up FOS.0012.0001.1939 on the other side. Do you want me to read it out again? FOS, FOS.0012.0001.1939. And if we go to page three, see issues in dispute, sets out the four issues that will need to be investigated. The first one being, yeah. did yes. Bank of Queensland engage in irresponsible <coughs> lending when it approved the business loan in October 2012? And the first question that BFQ was asked to answer was, is my understanding of the dispute correct? 
and the response is BOQ is of the view that Foz's understanding of the dispute is correct. Thank you, yes. Now, what I'd like you to do if you're able is explain why Bank of Queensland was agreeing with Foz's summary of the dispute, given that Foz understood that there was a question as to whether Bank of Queensland had engaged in irresponsible lending when it approved the business loan in October 2012. But BOQ had already determined by the 12th of December 2014, and in fact had determined three months earlier, that it had engaged in irresponsible lending. Um, unfortunately, I can't, uh, I can't explain that. Have you made any internal inquiries to understand why that approach was taken? No. Do you know whether or not this is the standard approach of Bank of Queensland's Customer Relations Department? I do not know that. Right. Now, if we go on the document on the left-hand side to page .0246, Sorry, 0245. Thank you. And you see point number eight. So this is an additional point beyond the seven points raised by, I'm sorry, actually, before I do that, can we also, on the document on the left, on the right hand side, can we go to page 1942? And you see the seventh question that Foz had asked Bank of Queensland was detailed basis on which lending was approved with reference to lending guidelines and or policy and information provided by applicant. And point number seven of Bank of Queensland's response is, the applications for finance were assessed in line with the policies applicable at the time of the application. Is that statement in number seven, in your view, true? I'm sorry, the statement by Bank of Queensland, <coughs> true? Um, my view is they were assessed in line with. Unfortunately, there were mistakes in it. I see. So it's, it's not, in your view, strictly untrue to say they were assessed in accordance with the policies. It's just it omits a relatively key fact. Do you agree? Yes. All right. And then Bank of Queensland adds an eighth point, which is Bank of Queensland is of the understanding that the applicant has previously provided information to FOS that suggests that independent professional advice was obtained prior to the purchase of the business being completed if the independent professional advice obtained suggested the applicant not purchase the business, yet still opted to, then Bank of Queensland is of the view that should FOS find that there was maladministration in lending, then the outcome should be proportioned given this information. Yes. And I want to ask you about a couple of elements of this statement. The first is, Bank of Queensland is clearly taking the position that there is some question about whether there was maladministration in the loan. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I believe they've it, um, admitted that there was maladministration in the loan. In this letter, they are clearly taking the position that there is some question about whether there is maladministration in the loan. It doesn't say the bank doesn't accept as maladministration, it's stating if FOS finds as maladministration. But we had a 
said that there was maladministration. No, you'd said internally that yes. there was maladministration. Oh, yes. And to FOS, you agreed that one of the issues was whether or not there was maladministration. You agree with that? Yes. And to FOS, you said if FOS finds that there was maladministration, then they want to raise another issue. You agree with that? Yes. And in response to FOS's question about whether lending was approved with reference to lending guidelines and or policy and information provided by the applicant, your response was the applications were assessed in line with policies and what wasn't said by Bank of Queensland to FOS was, but they were assessed incorrectly and there was maladministration in the loan. Do you agree with that? Yes. Do you regard it as appropriate that Bank of Queensland took this approach in its correspondence with FOS? No. Now, the second thing that I want to ask you about is this idea of the legal advice as, or the professional advice. You may not know the answers to this, but were there ongoing discussions occur occurring at this time between Mr. Vine from Bank of Queensland and the representative from FOS? After the, after the state? No, no well, around this oh, time. So oh. do you know how it is that Bank of Queensland had been told about the independent professional advice? Uh, no, other than the client had, if memory serves me right, I think the client had told us that they were talking to their accountant during the process. Well, you see the statement is Bank of Queensland is of the understanding that the applicant has previously provided information to FOS. But you're not sure what that, where that understanding came from? No. Presumably the only, could only have come from FOS. We presume so. All right. Can we bring up tab 22 of Mr. Vine's statement, which is BOQ.0001.0023.0938? So this is a further internal file note of Bank of Queensland on the 12th of February 2015. Uh, yes, and just to refresh my memory, we were talking about November 14 before, weren't we? You mean the file notes? Yeah, the, the previous file note, yeah. Uh, the previous file note was the 18th of September 2014 okay. and the previous letter that we looked at was the 12th of December 2014. Thank you. So this is now the file note on the 12th of February 2015? Yes. And presumably there's been some communication from FOS to Bank of Queensland in order to tell Bank of Queensland that FOS have completed their investigation and have advised that there is maladministration in lending? Yes. And as is noted, this was identified at the time of our investigation and confirmed by Vanessa? Yes. And that means confirmed internally? Yes. But not, as we know, confirmed to FOS? Yeah, it appears that way. And instead, Boz has presumably spent three months trying to do its own assessment to figure out whether there was maladministration in the lending. I believe so. And then if we go to page three, which is .0940. And you see there's a section which is other information and I'm sorry, can we, can we just take that down for a moment because the name's not redacted? You've got a copy of that, I think, Mr. 
Mr Snell, which is tab 122. Commissioner, can I just indicate the name of the owner manager of the branch was identified and that's subject to a non-publication direction by you, Commissioner. Thank you. It's just my junior attempting to help Mr. <laughs> Mr. Snell find the volumes of his exhibits. So we're short of paper. <laughs> I believe there are, at least my version of Mr. Snell's statement has six volumes to it. Have you got tab 122? Yes. If the, if the name's now been redacted, it can probably come back up on the screen, but we, I might just get my, one of my instructing solicitors to go around and check that. Now, what yes. the point that is made on that page, have you got that? It's page yes. three of the document. <laughs> And there's a section in the middle called other information. Do you see that? Mm. Yes. And it says, while FOS have ruled maladministration in lending, the following should be noted. And it's then said, there we go. Prior to the business purchase settlement, Ms. Rich has obtained professional advice from her accountant and legal representative. The advice to the applicant stated the business was not viable. While we do not hold a copy of this correspondence, FOS have confirmed that this was advised by the applicant. Yes. Can I just ask about that? Can we put that document on one side of the screen and bring up on the other side of the screen the advice document, which is FOS.0012.0001.1005? and go to the page dot one two four nine. One two four nine. So this is, as <clears throat> best we can tell, the document that's being referred to as the advice and the relevant statement seems to be the bottom, pro bottom line profits already look skinny to me, especially if deemed salaries for proprietors working in the business have not been included in the salaries expense figures. I think large rent increase or large capital cost on <coughs> refurbs would hurt these businesses. That, to be fair to Bank of Queensland, doesn't seem to be a document that was actually ever provided to Bank of Queensland, as best we can tell. Have you seen that document in your review of the records? Uh, no, I think I saw it yesterday. All right. And so, again, to be fair to Bank of Queensland, the statement, the advice to the applicant stated the business was not viable that doesn't seem to reflect the email. Do you agree with that? I suppose it, term, it depends on the termination of Skinny, but yeah, it doesn't say it's unviable. But, and this is the point I want to make, it's not as if Bank of Queensland had read this document and therefore that's why it thought that was what the advice was. The reason Bank of Queensland thought that that was what the advice was was because that is what FOS had told Bank of Queensland was the advice. I believe that's the case, yes. So it appears as if, for whatever reason, FOS had read the bottom line profits already look skinny to me as meaning the business was not viable. That's the first point. Mm -hmm. And then told that to Bank of Queensland. 
It appears that way, yes. And that's then the explanation of the push that Bank of Queensland makes to say that the advice was that the business was not viable. It seems that way. And then there's another point which is made, point number two, which is it appears that the applicant may have made an offer to purchase the business not subject to finance. Mm -hmm. And then having observed those two points, there's then a further proposed resolution which is now less favourable to Ms Richards than what had been proposed in September of 2014. Now it's that responsibility be apportioned 60% to Bank of Queensland and 40% to Ms Richards. Yes. And there's then a change to the proposed resolution at the bottom of page one, if we go over, sorry, bottom of page three, and if we go over to page four. Yes. And again, it doesn't appear that Bank of Queensland made that offer to Ms Richards. No, I don't believe so, in exactly those terms. I'm sorry, say that again? No, I don't believe so. All right. And then if we then bring up what should be tab 123 of your statement, which is BAQ.0001.0033.6267. So we now I'm sorry, actually before we look at that document, can we can we bring up a different document which is BAQ.0001.0033.6266? So this is following on from that internal file note and it appears that what has happened is that FOS has contacted Mr Vine and told Mr Vine that FOS has concluded that there's maladministration in lending. So that's we get to the document itself or in by about mid-February and that's what's reflected in the file note we looked at. Do you agree with that? Yes. yes. And appears to have invited Ms Devine to make an offer to the applicant, to Ms Richards, to try to resolve it. Yes. And Ms Devine has internally identified a recommended offer that might be made. Yes. But... Rather than make that offer, what Bank of Queensland did was to write back to the representative of the Ombudsman and say, Bank of Queensland has reviewed, considered the information available and based on the limited, financial, limited information available, Bank of Queensland is not in a position to make an offer at this time. The information that Bank of Queensland is of the view that would be required includes, but is not limited to, and it then seeks family trust financials for the preceding financial year, personal tax returns for the preceding financial year, and the names of beneficiaries of family trusts. And then says, Bank of Queensland seeks FOS's assistance to obtain the above information to support the applicant's comments made in submission to FOS regarding non-receipt in income salary and that FOS issue the recommendation in line with its current findings. Yes. And do you, do you know or understand why it is that this information was needed in order to be able to make an offer? Uh, no, I don't know, but... Uh 
it appears that he's trying to understand where some distributions have gone from the business and, and would that have ha impacted on the, the viability of the business? I, that's no, just, no, that, that's well, just me. That's, no, only, that's, that's speculation only that, that can't be right because this is seeking it for distributions for the financial year ending 30 June 2010 for the family, sorry, 2014 for the family trust. The loans made right. in the end of 2012. Sorry, you're right. And yeah. the viability or serviceability of it was being assessed as at 2012. Yep. Do you agree with that? Correct, yes. All right. Now, can we then go, I'm sorry, attend to that document, Commissioner. The email of, uh, from Vine at BOQ to Gardini FOS, uh, 13 Feb 05, BOQ 0001-0033-6266 will be exhibit 3.39. And then can we bring up tab, now bring up tab 123, which is BOQ.0001.0033.6267. So the, no, BOQ.0001.0033.6267. So this is an internal email of Bank of Queensland where Mr Vine is explaining FOS have rung and discussed the outcome of their investigation of the customer's complaint of maladministration in lending. Yes. And so, they know, or FOS thinks that it has, I'm sorry, Bank of Queensland thinks that it knows what the result is going to be at this time. Sorry, you're saying Bank that? Bank of Queensland thinks on the 13th of May that it knows what the result is going to be. Yes. And it notes that FOS have found in favour of the customer on maladministration and says both myself and Vanessa have previously identified these issues when we undertook an investigation at the beginning of the FOS dispute. Yes. And then you'll see what's said under the heading proportion of liability. Throughout the investigation of the dispute by FOS, as we have known that there was maladministration in lending, I have endeavoured to minimise the restitution payable. You see that? Yes, I can see that. And then Mr Vine helpfully explains how he went about doing that, which was this has included discussing the following with FOS on numerous occasions. Customer executed contract to purchase prior to application being assessed customer receiving professional advice prior to signing the contract to purchase, customer claiming no income received from the business even while she took time out of teaching. See that? Yes. And if we just pause on that, have you made any internal inquiries as to why this strategy was pursued? No, I haven't. Do you regard this strategy as appropriate? Uh, I have very limited experience with this division, but from what I've read and understanding the earlier uh, determination of the maladministration, I personally believe Mr Vine's first recommendation is probably the more accurate. I will we'll come back to that in a moment. And so then, Ms. Devine, in fact, seems to have overachieved. Foz, he says, FOS have proportioned the responsibility 60-40. This means Bank of Queensland is only responsible to pay, 40, to pay restitution of 40% of the total bank charges previously debited to the business term loan. Yes, that's what it says. And, of course, what had been foreshadowed some months earlier was achieving a 60-40 split against Bank of Queensland. Yes? Yes. All right. 
Now, and then if we then bring up tab 124 of the statement, which is BAQ.0001.0023.1.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.40, emails between Vine, Mert and others, May and June 2015, BOQ 0001002320005. I want to ask you then, as the representative of Bank of Queensland, some questions about this. Does Bank of Queensland regard the strategy that it adopted in relation to Ms Rich's FOS complaint as appropriate? Uh, although a representative of Bank of Queensland, I haven't had discussions with others. My, my view is, as, as stated before, once we understood that we were uh, we had made issues, we had made errors that had created some of the issues, then we should have accepted some the responsibility. One of the consequences of this strategy was that a recommendation wasn't even issued by FOS until nine months after Mr Vine had first identified the errors and made the recommendation to compensate Ms Richards? It appears that way. Do you agree with me that it is, this is not fair and reasonable behaviour by Bank of Queensland towards one of its customers? Uh, when, when we're awaiting for a FOS determination, we work with the client. And so the, the delay didn't change the situation with us and them. I'm sorry. Do you agree that the strategy that was adopted in relation to FOS of not acknowledging maladministration up front and instead working and having repeated conversations to try to limit the extent of liability, so that's the strategy that I'm concerned with that we've right. take, gone through, is one that was not fair or reasonable towards the customer? Um, my personal belief is, no, the strategy wasn't fair and reasonable. Right. Commissioner, would it be convenient to take a short adjournment at that point? I think I'll be perhaps another 20 to 30 minutes with... I come back at midday. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Snell, I asked you some questions at the outset about the audit process of reference of dealing with the branches. And I understood you to say that's that audit process, it doesn't report to you? No. And it's not something where you're directly overseeing the audits that are undertaken? No. And you what level of familiarity then do you have with what the audit results are? Uh, I have relationship managers with portfolios that ha are audited as well. Those audits are related to uh, the administration of loans and, and products. And so uh, should, the, should the audit relate to those same products, then I'll have, I'll have an awareness. Um, I'm also, I also attend some committees where I'm, I'm aware of the general uh, the trend, I suppose, if you want to say that, um, but not the not the detail. And then, based on the knowledge that you have, are you able to make any comment as to what level of compliance there is in owner-manager branches based on the audits? Based on my understanding, um, from 2012 to where we are today, um, my, my belief is that in 2012 it was quite a low. Um, adherence to compliance and since that time the banks worked very hard to improve it so we've made a number of changes which include new management so a new chief executive officer a new chief risk officer um, we've implemented teams so a rose team which is retail operational service experience so it's a training team so effectively when the audits are conducted and there's outcomes <coughs> excuse me those teams will get involved in training to to uplift some of the skills within the branches and we have a consequence management plan or program that uh, uh, uses consequence for people that don't try to uh, follow the or, or improve with those, those trainings. Do you, so if we just take that in stages, in 2012 when you joined you were aware that the level of compliance in owner-manager branches was quite low? Uh, I didn't have a detailed understanding but I, I've been in, as I said, at, at meetings I'd heard 
information and from what I've read from the details I've put to the, together for the commission. And you've, you were aware that efforts have been made by Bank of Queensland to try to improve that situation over the last five years? Yes, there's, there's been a lot of activities occurred to improve it. And how successful have those activities been? Uh, as I say, uh, I'm not involved in it in, in detail, but my understanding is the, if we call it a trend, is, has moved in the right direction um, in terms of the number of fails has, has reduced uh, and the number of needs improvements has in increased as I believe the satisfactory has increased. And one of the issues, do you agree with the owner-manager model in relation to compliance is the remuneration structure that's used? Uh, the remuneration structure is there for a number of reasons. Um, whether that's a driver of compliance issues, I'm not sure. Well, let's, I just want to explore this. You deal with it in some detail in your statement, the nature of the various remuneration structures. Mm -hmm. And the way in which the owner-manager branches operate, if I attempt to summarise it, is the owner-manager is appointed as an agent of Bank of Queensland. Correct. And the owner-manager pays fees to Bank of Queensland? Uh, yes. Franch an initial franchising fee and other fees along the way? That's correct. And, and they also... Uh, run the, the uh, pay the running costs for the for the agency uh, and we'll we'll come to that in a moment okay. but the owner manager doesn't receive any salary package from the bank no the owner manager only receives income based on commission commission yes and the you referred to paying the running expenses of the agency. The agency refers to the branch? Is the physical right? location, yes. And the employees, the bank tellers, everybody within that branch, they are employees of the owner-manager rather than of Bank of Queensland? Yes. And the owner-manager then pays those employees rather than Bank of Queensland? Yes. So the way in which those employees within an owner-manager branch are remunerated is a matter for the owner-manager subject to certain programs, not a matter for the for Bank of Queensland? Other than with, through our people and culture or, or our payroll department, we set some minimum expectations as to paying the award in the area and the, and the like, yes. And it's not possible, or at least it's the intention of Bank of Queensland, that it's not possible for a member of the public to distinguish between an owner-manager branch and a corporate-owned branch? I know it is, it is illustrated in marketing in terms of they'll say that they are the owner of the branch. C can I just, just so I understand that, is this, perhaps this is a change, can we bring up tab 153 to your statement BAQ.0001.0050.0329? And if we go to the page dot, and you'll, sorry, I should say you, sorry. How are you going? Do you need to find that document or are you happy to go off the oh, screen? happy off the screen if that's okay. You'll see this is the accreditation process for an owner manager. And the revision date of this one is the 3rd of December, 2010. Yes. If we go to page dot zero three three one. And if we blow up the sixth paragraph from the top, beginning the public, it says the public should not be able to distinguish between a Bank of Queensland corporate branch managed by a bank salaried branch manager and a Bank of Queensland owner manager branch operated by an OMB agent. Yes, I see that. Has that, <coughs> is that a policy that you believe has changed or are you referring to something else? No, I don't know. I would say that the external physical premises wouldn't distinguish 
However, the internal, so an email from an owner manager would have an email trial that states that they're the owner. They're the owner manager. Yeah. It might be there in their email signature line. Yeah. As it states there, they can get approval from the bank. So they, uh, I imagine they uh, regularly ask for approval to do things. All right. And then can we bring up the owner manager agency agreement, which is tab 156 BAQ.0001.0059.0014. And I understand, I should check with you, is this the current OMB agreement or is this the previous OMB agreement? I believe this is a new OMB agreement being rolled out at the time, at Th this time. This is the, the, what's in your statement you distinguish yeah. between the old OMB agreement, which was what was... 2010. And that was what was being used by the manager of the Piri Street branch? Right, yes. And the new owner, manage, owner management agreement, which is this one. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. And this is the current one, is it? Um, I'm going to say I don't know exactly. The only reason I say that is there is work being done to update it, and I'm not sure if it's being rolled out at the present time. However, it would just be... Yeah, the agreement itself would be the same. I just understand some of the um, fit for biz. Sorry, the fit for biz did you refer to? Mm, some oh. of that has changed. We'll, we'll come to that in a moment. So I just want to understand precisely how an owner manager gets paid at the moment. If we go to the page dot zero zero two zero. We see in the middle of the page a definition of agent's commission. So the commission payable to the agent in accordance with the revenue structure set out in item one of schedule one of this agreement. Yes. And there's a, and we'll come to it, but there's a schedule to these agreements that sets out how the, how the owner manager is going to be paid. Yes. And then it's a matter for the owner manager to then figure out how that money will then be distributed amongst the owner manager's employees. Is that yes. right? And if we then go to page dot zero zero two one, you see there's a definition on the bottom half of the page of a balanced scorecard, which is said to be a package of KPIs are calculated by the bank for each agent who is an owner manager and branch within the bank network yes and i can take you to the term perhaps but the, if we go to page 0038 So this is the agent's commission and it's said that the bank will pay to the agent the agent's commission. We know the agent's commission is what's going to be defined in the schedule that we'll, we'll come to. You, I think, make a point about how the, how the balanced scorecard interacts with this. Could you just explain that to the commissioner? <clears throat> uh, well, I'm not, I'm not involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis, but my understanding is the agents' commissions are paid as per the uh, schedule schedules in the back. Um, however, there are balanced scorecards which determine uh, it now, today, it's on a points basis, and should they um, service more clients' needs in terms of placing more product, then they will receive more, and if they don't follow the um, compliance required by the bank, then they'll have deductions. And just let's make sure we've understood that. The 4.1 says that there's various payments to be made. 
4.4 provides for deductions that may be made against the Commission. And it doesn't seem, but perhaps there's something we're missing that to link into the balanced scorecards. But then 4.5 allows the bank to withhold payment of the commission in circumstances where the bank reasonably believes that the agent may be in or may be about to be in agent default or material breach under this agreement? Yes. And is, is failing to achieve a balanced scorecard, could that give rise to an agent default or material breach or you're not sure? I don't believe so. I believe it precludes them from additional payments under uh, the incentive, under K the KPI. I see. The, and I, this is the point I wanted to get at. As we understand it, the way in which the remuneration of owner-managers works, uh, they get commission. That's the first part of what they get. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just because it's being recorded, you need Sorry, to see. Yep. Yes or no? Yes. And then there's a scheme which involves a balanced scorecard. And is that called the fit for biz scheme? That's a part of that, yes. The balanced scorecard is part of the fit for biz scheme. Mm -hmm. And the fit for biz scheme would entitle a an owner manager to receive extra amounts of money on top of commission? Yes. And if there, and I think I may have been confused, when you referred to deductions before, are that, those are points deductions, is that right? Yes, which translates to remuneration, yes. And would translates, in the case of owner managers, would translate to extra amounts not being paid under the fit for biz, is that right? I believe so. Rather than deductions being made against the commission? Yes. And so if you don't hit certain gateways or requirements under the fit for biz scheme as an owner manager, then you might be precluded for a period of time from getting cash payments or prizes or things like that under the fit for biz. That's correct. All right. And you seem to make a point in your statement about clause 4.5 of the agreement about withholding commission. Are you able to explain to the commissioner what that point is? My actual understanding is not deep enough to be able to explain, other than I believe that should an owner manager uh, fail required compliance activities, then, then commissions may be withheld. And there's also a list of products that are non-commission, that if they enter into a transaction of those products, then they will, will not receive the commission on. Right. And it appears, but you may not have a deep enough understanding to explain this, as if under 4.5b, the premise of the withholding is that there's some default or material breach and that the bank may suffer loss, damages or costs. But perhaps that's not the right construction of the term. You may just not know. I wouldn't like to speculate other than I understand that should a owner manager step outside of their agreement, then they are liable. If they breach the agreement? Yes. But failing to achieve a balanced scorecard isn't a breach of the agreement, is it? I don't believe so. Right. And then... I'd then like to... Just get some understanding of the fit for biz scheme. So this is the additional incentive that might be paid to an owner manager. Is that right? Yes. And <coughs> sorry, actually we should just to be so that I can perhaps highlight the other part of the point I think you were attempting to make in your statement. Can we go to boq.0001.0041.0296, which is tab 44?
So BAQ.0001.0041.0296. So this is the previous version of the owner-manager branch agency agreement. You can see it was amended on the 3rd of August 2011. Yes, yes. And if we go to the page dot zero three one three. So this is that previous version of Clause 4, and I think what you tried to call out in your statement is that, at least under the new agreement, there's the contractual right to withhold a commission, whereas under the old agreement, there wasn't the right to withhold a commission. Maybe you're not sure. This might have been well, drafted by somebody who wants to make this point for you. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, the 5.3, 7.6, and I, I don't know those off heart. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, it refers to clauses 5.3 and 7.6, so I don't know what they state for me to be able to comment. Well, if you go over to 0314. Five three is the monthly licence fee. Oh, sorry, you're talking about what the deductions are. Yeah, yeah, and the deductions. Yeah. So, so there, there was a deductions clause in the new contract, but there was also a withholding clause. Right. All right, that's all right. I, you know that you make a point about this in your statement, Mr. Oh, Snell. I've read my statement, but I don't know the detail of, of those transactions. All right, uh, and then what is what happens is that. Bank of Queensland in 2011 decides to implement this extra remuneration scheme to reward owner managers uh, and to encourage owner managers to obtain new clients to the bank. Yes. Yes. And if we bring up BAQ.0001.0033.4453, which is tab 46 to Mr. Snell's statement. So this is the first star rating scheme. And if we go to the page dot four four five six. And if we pop out the first four paragraphs under one point one. explains the bank has launched the star rating scheme, which is, as it says, in essence, a sales incentive scheme, providing rewards in return for strong all-round performance by owner managers. There are benefits for both the bank and owner managers, which will be outlined in this information pack. And it goes on to say, the key focus of the star rating scheme is to increase revenue, create shareholder value, and drive behaviours that are consistent with the bank's core values. Your, I think your summary of it was, it was about trying to, I think you said, bring in more customers. Was that how you put it? But in fact, it's a sales incentive scheme, isn't it? It is, yes. And so the situation then was, as at 2011, owner managers could receive two types of remuneration. The first was commission. The second was under the sales incentive scheme, then called the star rating scheme. Is that right? Yes. And if we go to page dot four four five nine. <coughs> the there's key performance indicators and there's there are two gateways. So as we understand it, the initial gate openers are compliance and quality. The compliance, 
you can see over the page is not having failed the audit and the credit and not having various problems with credit risk review and the quality is not having arrears outside of one to 29 days and not having outstanding annual reviews. Can you just explain to the commissioner what's the annual review that's being referred to? Uh, so when we originate a new commercial loan, uh, on an annual basis, we ask the client to update us with their financials, their business performance, sometimes a business plan should there be changes. And the, uh, the staff member will look at the, the uh, financials and they'll undertake a updated risk rating to ensure that there's been either no deterioration or otherwise um, some improvement. And then that is uh, sent to credit risk assessment to confirm. And assuming you get through the gates, then you get paid something that is judged against lending, growth in deposits, cross-selling, selling of insurance, and some sort of customer growth incentive. Is that right? That's how it was measured, yes. And if we go to page.4461, then a series of rewards of things that could be won on an annual or quarterly basis, depending on how you scored under the scheme? Yes. So the top annual prize was a BMW and travel vouchers, and it descends down into waiving the IT fee on a quarterly basis. Yes. All right. And then that was replaced by the Fit for Biz scheme. And, and the Fit for Biz scheme introduced the balanced scorecard. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. And if we go to tab 51, boq.0001.0033.6869, So this is, seems to be the initial program in 2013? Yes. And yeah. if we go to dot six eight seven three, so the, net, the network of branches was to be tiered up based on recurring income? Yes. And then if we go to dot six eight seven six, is then an explanation of how the balanced scorecard would be derived and 41% would be based on lending, that's lending growth, is that right? Yes. 22% against deposits. Yes. 20% against cross sell. Yes. And then 17% for compliance and the compliance issues, we can see if we go over to dot six eight seven seven. are based on percentages in, percentage of arrears and whether or not those annual reviews you talked about were outstanding. Yes. And depending on how the branch performed across those various categories, there'd then be your points that would be earned. Is that right? That's correct. And there were no gate openers for the Fit for Biz program? Oh, I'm assuming, and I'm sorry, I don't, don't know the exact answer, but there's still a requirement to pass audit. So there, well, I think perhaps what you're talking about is there was the what referred to as gate closes, which are perhaps oh. the equivalent. So if we go to dot six eight seven nine, if you were subject to consequence management, then that might be a gate closer. 
Yes. And if you engaged in things outside of franchise integrity, which would include gaming the Fit for Biz scorecard, that might be a gate closer. Yes. And so if you were subject to consequence management because of a poor audit result, then you might be shut out of this additional incentive program. Yes. All right. And then if we go to tab 54, which is the 2017 program, that's BAQ.0001.0033.3841. There was revision of the of the scorecards in 2017. That's correct. And if we go to page dot three eight four seven, explains the key changes, which are sales KPI points were increased to eight hundred and fifty points. Quality measures now one hundred and fifty points increase of cross-sale points to deepen customer relationships. And there's something which is tracks quality measure to cha change to completion of monitoring and supervision activities. Can you just explain to the commissioner what tracks is? So I'm not sure what the term tracks is, but we run a smart attestation program, which is where the branches and regional managers attest to activities around monitoring and supervision. So I believe that that is where that data is captured and is then checked for completion. All right. And then if we go to tab 100, I'm sorry, 55, which is BAQ.0001.0041.0535. So this is the 2018 update. And if we go to page dot zero five four one. This explains the, it's quite small, but this explains the key changes for 2018. And if we go to dot zero five four five, Actually, if we go to dot zero five four six, something seems to have gone awry with the printing of the heading, but the this explains how the balanced scorecard is made up now. And you'll see thirty percent to the MFI objective, which is appears to be key indicators for the bank, but they mostly appear to be financial metrics. Do you agree? Uh, yes, we have a measure that's called main financial institution, and, and what it's trying to understand is um, whether or not the client sees BOQ as their, as their main bank. So there's quite a few clients in, out there that have um, multiple financial institutions, and we would like to service all the needs of our clients where possible. So hence that measure. And then 25% for funding, which means it's basically a growth metric. Are you growing the amount of business? Yes. And then 15% for what's referred to as protection. That, I understand, means selling St Andrews and Vero insurance project products. Yes. And then 15% for transactional, which means presumably cross-selling credit cards and other facilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? And then there's 15% for compliance, which is benchmarks set around key quality metrics. Yes. And then there's a wildcard. 
It appears so. And can I ask... All right. Your counsel would like you taken to the next page. Could we go to dot zero five four seven? And this is the rather than using the term gate opener or gate closer, now Bank of Queensland is using game changer. Is that right? Yes. And so if there's either a breach notice or disciplinary action in the case of, disciplinary action is only in the case of corporate, is that right? Yes. And the consequence of one of those game changes is that a certain number of points will be deducted for the month. Yes. And then other points for the quarter and a de decreasing number of points for the year. Yes, so the goal of the balance scorecard is to ensure a balance ledger, i.e. deposits are very important for a bank, not just lending, and compliance. And uh, although uh, there's humans, we, we measure it, and, and this is to, uh, to ensure that they're aware of what the, the bank's expectations are. And in a, in a quarter, if we go to dot zero five four five so this is this seems to be showing the number of points you could get for a quarter that if you manage to hit all of the various financial indicators you could get 850 points, is that right? If we exclude quality. Yes. And if you'd come unstuck on one of those game changes, then for the quarter you'd lose 350 points. Is that right? It appears so. Sorry. Or well, you're not sure? I think it's 150 points. Are you given the quality? Oh, I'm sorry, you're saying, no, no, you, if you've, you'd lose 150 points if you fail to satisfy any of the quality requirements, yes. is that right? Yeah. But you'd also lose 350 points if you'd been issued with a breach notice. Yes. That may be, we're just reading here. You're, I'm assuming, not in charge of administering this scheme, although you've given evidence about it. Is that right? Yes. And can I ask this then? One of the things you talk about is that there's an ongoing effort within Bank of Queensland to figure out how to bring the owner-manager remuneration model in line with Sedgwick. That, that has been raised and looked at, yes. And are you able to explain to the Commissioner, does Bank of Queensland have some idea of how that is even possible, given that all remuneration for the owner-managers starts with commission? To be frank, no. Uh, the bank has put a retail working group together to work through this, this matter with the intention to be um, compliant by June 19, but I, I, I'm not sure where we're at at the moment. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions. Before I call on you, Mr Hutley, just some matters I want to take up uh, with Mr Snell. Uh, the questions I want to ask you, Mr Snell, have two faces. There's one, uh, a face about what happened in this particular case that we looked at, but uh, the other face is much more general uh, issues about lending to uh, SMEs. You were asked a number of questions by council assisting about the respective roles of the bank and uh, the would-be borrower. Do you recall being asked those questions? Yes, Commissioner. 
There are a couple of expressions you used uh, in the course of your answer, as I noted them, were uh, our role is primarily to assist. Do you recall saying that or something close to that? I believe so. And you spoke of or you said we are part of the relationship. Yes. Now, I'm not to be understood as making any criticism uh, of you or that particular uh, phrasing. Uh, don't misunderstand the questions that now follow. But I put those against other statements that I find uh, other banks have made from time to time uh, where they speak, for example, of securing and enhancing the financial well-being of the customer. Have you seen that sort of expression used? Oh, I believe I've heard it, yes. Uh, I've seen reference to focus on the customer. Yes. I've seen reference to putting our customers first. Yes. Is that an expression which BOQ would use from time to time? Uh, yes, we would, we would tend to refer to the client as the central point of the relationship and putting them first. I've seen reference to acting in the best interests of the customer. Yes. I just want to ask your opinion about whether there's any disconformity between, on the one hand, that kind of statement, and on the other, firstly, uh, Bank of Queensland's uh, dealings with FOS in connection with this uh, particular case. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in terms of the statement generally, uh, I believe that people that work in the banking industry feel that and, and understand that with our clients we don't have a job or an institution, so the goal is to ensure that we look after our clients. Um, when it comes to being a part of the relationship or, or being uh, close to our clients, it, in, in my part of the world where the clients are larger, we have less, less client portfolios, we do actually have quite a regular interaction. In the SME part, i.e. the micro in particular, when you look at the fintechs today, they don't talk to the client at all. The, the delivery of product is, or the provision of services is online. So th there is definitely a, um, a disconformity in, in depending on the client. Um, my belief from reading the detail within this uh, case study, um, I don't believe we acted in the best interest. And come away from this case study and uh, let's leave on one side what happened or didn't happen uh, in this case. When trying to understand uh, what is, uh, what could be, what should be, the relationship between bank and small to medium enterprise customer, is there at least a possible misunderstanding by the customer of the role of the bank arising out of comments of the kind or statements of the kind I've referred to? Uh, I think there's challenges within the banks to deliver what they would like to deliver, whether that be restraints of technology, uh, numbers of people to fulfil. Um, so I think the I think the goal and the intentions there, but um, if I'm uh, if I'm answering your question, yes, there's there's definitely a deviation in terms of what the client expects and gets at times. In particular, is there any room for misunderstanding? on the one hand by the customer and on the other hand of, uh, by the bank about who's looking after whose interests uh, when customer is sitting down with the banker 
uh, talking about a transaction to which in many cases the customer is deeply committed mm. uh, and firmly persuaded uh, that this is something that uh, A, the customer wants to do and B, if the customer does it, it will succeed. Now, first is there a disconformity. The second question, so you can see where it's going, is, well, if there were to be such a disconformity, um, what, if anything, do I do about it? Simply observe it, move by. Uh, hmm. Do you see yeah. where the questioning's leading? Yes, Commissioner. Step one, is there a disconformity? Um, my personal belief is in the general uh, administration and delivery of banking products. No, I don't think there is. I, I do believe there is outliers which emphasise uh, activities that could definitely be done better. I, I think generally clients that come to... The them, human endeavour. Of course, yeah. there will always be things that can be done better. Of course, there will always oh. be mistakes. Accept all that. But, but if I'm sitting on the other side of the desk with one of my clients today, my expectation is I will do what they ask of me, if I can, so within the realms of what I can, can deliver. Um, so I think, I think, and so I suppose if you, if you took my situation there, which said I try to endeavour to do it every time, then your next step is from, from what you're evidencing that doesn't always occur, how do we fix that? I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Do you have anything out of that, Mr Hodge? No, thank you. Mr Hutley. I have no re-examination. Nothing, no. nothing arising out of that or at all? Yes, at all. thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Snell. You may uh, step down. And thank you. you are excused. Thank you. Well, Mr Hodge, where to now? Commissioner, we could adjourn for three minutes to switch the council around and move on to the next witness will be Mr Van Horen from CBA. There's a consumer witness that we have for the following case study that we need to get to this afternoon. So I just flag that as a, as a timing well, issue. I don't want to, my point, I just don't want to lose any time. No, well, if I come back at, uh, shortly before 10 to one. Thank you, Commissioner.